interesting aspects of psychosis. Uh, somebody's already raised a question about prodrome, so I'm guessing there is some um, you know, sensibility in the audience uh, for this area. So let me see how I can clarify this concept further for you. Um, the history of prodrome actually goes back, um, way back to the 1930s where uh, the famous uh, Dr. Mayer Gross first used this term. And subsequently, it was around the late 80s, 90s, where people actually started talking about how before even psychosis or schizophrenia starts, something's already you know, happening in these individuals, right? So Huber and Gross were the first people who um, you know, described what are famously called the basic symptoms. I will be elaborating on that a bit later in my talk. Uh, and they said, you know, there are these subjective disturbances. It's only something that the person feels. Something's going wrong with the way they think, with what they're perceiving, with their uh, self-regulation, affect. So there is a lot of self-experience changes, which may not always be evident to people around them. But people tend to experience it way before um, psychosis, uh, you know, any, any form of psychosis sets in. And then there was the famous ABC study the age, begin, and course of schizophrenia um, study, which, um, you know, look, which was actually able to pick up that 73% of patients diagnosed with psychosis had around a five-year-long prodrome. Now, th I think the most important thing to understand about prodrome is that prodrome is a retrospective construct. It is something that you identify after a person develops psychosis. So, uh, you know, you were talking about how do you identify, do you diagnose prodrome, you know, so are you ever going to write on your files, diagnosis prodrome? You're probably not going to do that. It is something that you will retrospectively think, oh, so this is what was happening. You know, the person was in a prodrome and now has developed uh, schizophrenia. So, you know, that's how Hafner et al. in their study uh, said that 73% of them had actually been having difficulties way before, uh, you know, the psychosis started. Um, what is also interesting is that, you know, there's, there's not a lot of um, community assessments for uh, prodromal symptoms or attenuated psychosis. It goes by different names uh, because it's very hard to do studies like that. But then there have been some investigations that tell us that, you know, almost 4 to 8 percent of normal people living in the community can actually have psychosis-like symptoms. And these kind of experiences can be almost 10, you know, every 10th child, so almost 10% of children, I guess, with their imaginary friends and a lot of fantasy play and, you know, so obviously none of this is, you know, truly psychotic symptoms in that sense. But if you're looking at what prodrome can look like, so symptoms, mimicking prodromal symptoms can be quite prevalent, but they may obviously not always mean pathology. They will, they will not always mean, uh, you know, the onset of uh, psychosis later on. So, uh, like Tara Ma'am was uh, talking about the phases of schizophrenia, um, you know, so it is believed that before uh, the transition to frank psychosis, a patient with schizophrenia has passed through a pre-morbid phase where, you know, uh, you know, like neurodevelopmentally, what Ma'am was saying, that uh, people may already have some cognitive social deficits which neurodevelopmentally characterize them. There is the famous link between autism spectrum disorders and childhood onset schizophrenia, and sometimes it becomes hard to differentiate the two because of the similarities in social and cognitive disturbances. So there are pre-morbid difficulties, and then you know there are these so-called prodromal symptoms, where which can last from as long as one to five years. There are attenuated symptoms, social withdrawal, functional decline. So all of you know, so so a lot happens in a person with. Uh, who finally develops schizophrenia much before the onset of the illness. So, given this uh, very brief background, if we were to define prodrome, I find this the most useful definition. We're basically saying it's a heterogeneous groups of behaviors that are temporally related to the onset of psychosis, right? So there are many different types of behaviors, many different clusters of behaviors that occur together and Ultimately, if the person develops psychosis, then you say, okay, all of that was prodromal. Um, it is also something like understanding trait and state risk factors. Now, if you look at this slide, I have put, uh, you know, similar situations from cardiology um, and then compared them to how things work in psychiatry. 
So a trait risk factor is essentially something that's non-modifiable that you carry with you because of your genetic, biological endowments. So just like in cardiology, you have family history and the existence of hypertension as a trait risk factor. Similarly, in psychiatry too, family loading is a known risk factor for mental illnesses. Schizotypy, personality dysfunction, you know, these are all trait-related variables that can impact the future occurrence of mental health problems. State conditions, right? So traits is non-modifiable, you know, you carry it with you and then you develop some symptoms, you develop a state. So in cardiology, those states can be like angina pectoris, pre-infarction. In psychiatry, you know, you're, what we're talking about today, the attenuated symptoms, you know, uh, the prodromal symptoms, vague perceptual abnormalities. Uh, but mind you, these, you know, trait and state things are not just true for psychosis. They can also happen in mood disorders. They can also happen in, uh, you know, trauma related. So these uh, factors coming together, trait vulnerabilities and then the onset of some attenuated symptoms and then the occurrence of the major psychiatric uh, phenomena can, you know, happen across disorders. It's not something that is specific to psychosis in that sense. Um, so what are the tra trait risk factors for psychosis? You know, there are the early developmental, early childhood uh, factors, uh, perinatal medical complications, um, you know, developmental vulnerabilities. Then there are environmental factors also. You know, the occurrence of psychosis has been linked to urbanization. It has been linked to, um, you know, immigrant uh, status, especially in low ethnic density areas. So the kind of social stress that people experience can make them vulnerable to developing psychosis and exposure to um, chemical substances like cannabis. And then there is also, you know, a big chunk of the genetic and gene environment interactions that can create a huge vulnerability for psychosis later on. But if we talk more specifically about the state factors or the pre-psychotic symptoms, the prodromal symptoms, like I was telling you, they are quite heterogeneous. So there can be many different types. There can be mood-related symptoms, negative symptoms, uh, basic symptoms, and attenuated positive symptoms. Um, this was an interesting study done from uh, Tara Mam's uh, foundation. At, this was done at SCARF, where they interviewed 40 caregivers of patients with first episode psychosis. And they used the psychiatric and personal history schedule, where you, know, you comprehensively try and assess everything that has happened even before the onset of the current uh, morbid status. So they were interested in looking at, you know, what were the earliest things that people were able to pick up in their relatives who developed psychosis? You know, what did you notice changed about this person? And of the many, many types of symptoms and behaviors that they got, they did a factor analysis and they came up with these four factors, right? So these are PCA derived um, factors. Of these four, they found that the depressive factor and the vegetative factor were the most commonly picked up symptoms identified in patients who presented with first episode psychosis. So what did their relatives say? They said that, you know, this person had already started becoming quite negligent of their activities, their routines, had started losing interest, uh, had started becoming aggressive, had started looking frightened, you know, so, so there was these depressive spectrum symptoms and the vegetative disturbances, right? So disturbances in appetite, sleep, uh, sexual activity, um, social functioning, etc. right? So um, pre-psychotic symptoms or prodromal symptoms can, you know, basically be of many, many different types. Um, it's also been interesting uh, to see how cognitive uh, dysfunction, you know, and as you will see on the slide, right from vocabulary to block design, digit symbol, um, trail making tests, the continuous performance. So many different types of cognitive function tests done on people who develop psychosis show deficits as compared to people who don't develop psychosis, right? So cognitive dysfunction is um, also quite prevalent in this pre-psychotic or prodromal state, just like the mood and negative and other kinds of symptoms, right? So people who convert have the highest rates of significant impairments in cognitive functions. So I mean, all of this sounds quite confusing, right? So, so what is prodrome? Is, is it even really anything? Is it an entity? Can we really even pick it up? Um, so people have come up with a lot of interesting diagnostic tools. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the interview for retrospective assessment of schizophrenia. Um, there are two tools that are particularly interesting here. 
the ones in the bold uh, font. One is the SIPS, or the Structured Interview for Prodromal Symptoms, and the second is the Schizophrenia Proneness Instrument. The SIPS is uh, interesting um, simply because that's what people are most commonly using um, across the world, both the North American uh, Consortium on Early um, Psychosis as well as the European Consortium, they're both using these uh, criteria. The schizophrenia proneness instrument is, uh, well, of personal interest to me because it has a child and youth version, so you can use it on very, very young uh, people as well. Uh, so let me just explain you how these tools work. So this is um, the structured interview for prodromal symptoms. What this does is, you know, so, so there are certain measures it looks at. It looks at a scale of prodromal symptoms, uh, schizotypal personality disorder features, uh, the family history, and global assessment of functioning. And by using these different measures, it then has put forth criteria for different types of prodromal syndromes, right? So there can be the brief intermittent psychotic symptom syndrome. There can be the attenuated positive symptom syndrome. So they're saying that you use, you know, the, the, the list on top, the measures, you use them in different permutations, combinations. And by doing that, you can derive one of these types of prodromal syndromes. Right? So that's how it that works. And the scale for prodromal symptoms is one of the measures it uses, which comprises of, you know, basically symptoms of um, um, schizophrenia. There are positive symptoms, negative symptoms, disorganization symptoms, and general symptoms. The difference is these are not, uh, you know, the, the, the positive and negative symptoms here will not you know, be like they would present in schizophrenia. So they will not be florid hallucinations or delusions. Instead, there will just be unusual thought content, ideas of reference or persecution, some suspiciousness, grandiosity, uh, brief lasting, perceptual abnormality. So everything is attenuated, brief lasting. You know, it's there, but it's not there. It's very hard to say if it's really there or not. So that's the difference from, uh, you know, when you would diagnose somebody with actually having schizophrenia. So this is how the SIPS works. The schizophrenia proneness instrument doesn't rely so much on the positive negative symptoms. It relies more on what are called basic symptoms, right? And like I was telling you, it's, it's interesting because you can use this uh, uh, tool from eight years age onwards, uh, but because it relies a lot on cognitive dysfunction, uh, it, it's probably more reliable when used in people over the age of 13 years, right? So they can perform the tests reliably. Um, basic symptoms, uh, why are they called basic? Because they are believed to, to, to be psychological expressions of the underlying neurobiological disturbance, okay? So basic symptoms can be seen before, during, after, in between episodes. So basic symptoms can be seen at any time uh, in the journey of schizophrenia. So it's basically something that's permanently going wrong in the brain of a person who develops schizophrenia, right? So, so it's basic to the neurobiology of this disorder. Whether or not positive symptoms, negative symptoms, or other kinds of gross um, psychotic symptoms are present. And, you know, the, again, um, they will be quite amorphous and hard to pick up. There will be disturbances in motivation, uh, stress tolerance, coping skills, um, affective changes, uh, thinking, uh, speech, perception, motor action. So, you know, again, very heterogeneous, uh, touching upon different kinds of domains um, of in an individual, um, but, you know, without true uh, characteristic psychotic symptoms. And like I was telling you, the phenomenology here is very different from the attenuated psychosis where you actually talk about uh, positive and negative symptoms, you know, that's not there here. Um, it is said that, you know, probably using a combination of these kind of basic symptoms and the uh, prodromal symptoms that I described earlier, the positive, negative, probably using a combination of all of this works better than using either one alone, you know, so the more number of symptoms, more clusters of symptoms that you have, your likelihood of picking up somebody at risk goes up, right? Um, so, I'm going to very, very briefly touch upon uh, two studies that have actually looked at uh, diagnosing prodromal symptoms, uh, symptoms. You know, so they have said that we are going to uh, screen people for the presence of prodromal symptoms and see what happens if we follow them up for some time. So one is called the North American Prodrome Longitudinal Study. The other is called the European Prediction of Psychosis Study. 
as Tara Ma'am was saying, uh, the Pace Clinic in Australia is, of course, world famous in uh, uh, you know studying uh, early psychosis and you know pre-psychotic states for a very long time. Um, so, the Naples study is a consortium of eight prodromal psychosis research centers. Now, both of these studies, right, the North American study and the European study, what is important to understand is they identify these features in treatment-seeking populations. So they are not going to the community and screening people at random for prodromal symptoms. They are saying people who are going to come to us for help, we'll screen them and we'll see if we can identify these syndromes, right? Which means that people could be presenting to them with mood symptoms, effective, you know, uh, anxiety, uh, educational problems, you know, there could be a wide spectrum of things. And within that, they see if they are able to meet these criteria. And what they are able to do is, um, you know, when they longitudinally follow them up, of course, both of these studies, the main outcome they are looking at is predicting conversion to psychosis, right? So if I identify these symptoms, how many of them convert to psychosis? Also, uh, you know, by doing this, they hope to gather uh, evidence for diagnostic criteria, uh, predictors of onset, functional disabilities, and what happens if you intervene early, right? Uh, so I think you were asking that if there's prodrome, what should I do? You know, should I give medication? What should I do? So these studies are trying to answer those questions. And obviously, they're, they're, they're doing a lot of wonderful assessments, um, both at baseline and in follow-up. Uh, and both of these studies are now, you know, almost a couple of decades old. So we already know about, you know, what happened to these people in the long run, what were the conversion rates, and what did we learn uh, from doing these gigantic efforts um, in this manner. Um, so essentially, both of them, you know, picked up people on these three criteria. So they picked up three groups, the attenuated positive psychosis, brief limited intermittent psychotic symptoms, and genetic risk and deterioration. It's important for you to understand um, these three clusters because they, they, you know, they're very commonly talked about in research on a prodrome of schizophrenia. So the atten attenuated positive psychosis syndrome, which is also now part of the DSM-5 uh, areas for further study. It, it's not in the diagnostic uh, schedules per se, but it is an area for further study. So what is this syndrome? This is the emergence or worsening of non-psychotic disturbances in thought content, thought processes, perceptual abnormalities in the past year. How easy is it going to be to pick this up if somebody comes to you for a first time consultation, right? So uh, it's you know more useful to diagnose this retrospectively and say, okay, now I understand why all those things were happening because you know it was likely that schizophrenia is gonna come up. The brief limited intermittent psychotic symptom group is, you know, so unlike the attenuated psychosis syndrome, this brief limited one has actual positive symptoms, right? So a person can have um, suspiciousness, they can have perceptual abnormalities. However, the time duration is very tiny for, for us to actually call this um, psychosis or schizophrenia, right? So attenuated is quantitatively reduced, a brief limited is reduced in the time duration that the symptoms last for, right? The genetic risk and deterioration is basically people who have a genetic loading, family history, and they start having functional decline for, you know, an unidentifiable reason, right? So these are the three uh, most commonly studied clinical high-risk uh, populations. And like I was saying, this is um, already there in the DSM-5, gathering a lot of interest um, as an entity uh, for further study. So if you look at what happened in the North American and the European um, cohorts, so the North American cohort has published follow-up data for five years, the European one for about a year and a half, and these were their conversion rates. So 13% of people who were identified with one of these high-risk states transition to psychosis. It was 19% for the European group. What was interesting was that it was not these clinical high-risk syndromes that were enough to predict this conversion, but it was actually, you know, they had to come up with a prediction model. And this model comprised of demographic features, uh, the symptoms, the presentation, family history, cognitive functioning, and, you know, their global functioning. So when you put together 
features across these multiple dimensions, that is what actually predicts conversion, not merely the presence of, you know, one of the three syndromes that um, are studied in prodrome. Uh, subsequently, uh, you know, Fusa Poli have put together, have uh, done a meta-analysis of uh, prodromal studies that looked at conversion to psychosis. And as you will appreciate on the slide, anywhere between 10 to over 45 percent, the conversion rates can be. Right? So, uh, one group says almost half of the people I pick up with attenuated psychosis will develop schizophrenia. Another group says one in 10 people only. Right? So, there are wide variations. Um, again, you know, for the clinician, for, for all of us carrying this information to the clinic, it's not very clear what we're supposed to uh, take forward. Why so much variation in conversion rates? Probably because, you know, since these are systematic studies, people entering these studies may actually be receiving treatment. There may be a lot of intensive effort at treatment of high-risk states, thereby reducing conversion. There is one uh, of that possibility. There may also be a lead time bias, you know, so if I have attenuated psychosis symptoms today, when am I going to develop psychosis? Will it be five years down the line or 10 years down the line or 20 years? So it may just be that in the duration of follow-up, I didn't develop psychosis, but I could, you know, in the future. So there can be a lead time bias. There could also be a dilution effect, you know, um, the eyes see what the mind knows. So now that I know what prodrome is, I will see it in everybody who comes to me in the clinic, right? So there may be a dilution effect because I may be picking up a lot of false positive just because I'm looking for it uh, so actively, right? So, so there are several reasons proposed for why these conversion rates differ, but uh, we don't really know, um, you know, how any of this is truly working out as of now. So people have gone one step forward and said, okay, you know, let's try and do a staging. Let's not just say, I identify attenuated symptoms and therefore I know you're high risk. But let me see if I can stage these prodromal symptoms in some way. And this is what the New York Recognition and Prevention Program does. Um, so 171 clinical high risk individuals. Clinical high risk is those three groups. The genetic uh, risk, the brief limited intermittent uh, syndrome and the attenuated psychosis syndrome. So those three syndromes, they have then further sub-categorized into the topmost one that you will see are 46 people who primarily have only negative symptoms. So they probably belong to just the functional decline category, you know, just negative symptoms. No attenuated or brief limited positive symptoms. Then there's another group where there are negative symptoms, but there are also mild to moderate attenuated psychosis symptoms. A third group where negative symptoms with severe attenuated psychosis symptoms, right? So uh, very, very prominent attenuated psychosis symptoms. And, you know, they have scales to grade the severity, of course. And finally, there is a group which has not schizophrenia, but schizophrenia-like psychosis. And then they followed these people up for three years. So then they said that once I stage this, the prediction becomes a little bit better. How does it become better? Obviously, the ones who have schizophrenia-like psychosis, many of these may be the first episode psychosis group that Ma'am was talking about. So that group has the highest conversion rate to, to schizophrenia, right? Almost half of them convert to schizophrenia. Understandably, psychosis was already there. Uh, whereas the group right on top, where there were only negative symptoms, the conversion rate was very low. It was only about 6%. But what was interesting is that even though they didn't convert to psychosis or schizophrenia, the negative symptoms persisted, right? So, uh, you know, dysfunction and, you know, some disturbance in their affect and volition and drive and all of that, that persisted even though they didn't convert to schizophrenia. And the groups in between had, you know, rates um, between the two um, extreme categories, right? So clearly this does seem to be you know, much more useful in terms of understanding what's going to happen in the long run. So, what are they saying? They're saying that the severity of early symptoms plays a critical role in the clinical outcome, the time to conversion, as well as, you know, whether a person would require medication treatment or not, right? Because um, as ma'am was mentioning, there is this whole group, uh, you know, that says, why do you want to give risperidone to somebody who doesn't have schizophrenia? You know, why do you want to give it only on the basis of a hunch or only on the basis of saying you're at risk, so take it, you know? So that's very hard to understand and justify. 
but by staging people like this we might be uh, you know a little better informed so there are obviously a lot of caveats in prediction one is that it probably can only best be done by trained mental health professionals who are capable of putting together you know the criteria that were seen in the prediction model this is not something that can be used in the community uh, by lay uh, workers or just by using a screening instrument it's probably not something that's going to work on that model it has to be a clinic based thing um prediction is a relative probability it is not an inevitability right so we must remember that even if you know so many times we'll discuss it looks like prodrome but that looks like prodrome is a relative probability it's not an inevitability and that is the most important thing uh, for any clinician to remember there is a high risk of inaccurate prediction right remember conversion rates can be as low as uh, 10% so the cost benefit ratio the dynamic nature of risk estimation has to be uh, kept in mind possibly if we were you know and as more and more studies are coming up about the biological underpinnings uh, physiological underpinnings eeg markers uh, you know uh, specific genes that people are looking at so if we are actually able to put together something like this and then better characterize the high risk population you know that that might be a better um, uh, prediction process also looking at multiple dimensions right what i just presented a uh, staging of risk not just a yes or no category um you know the, the pace clinic published um, um a few years ago about um, you know how people with uh, very early psychosis or you know these attenuated symptoms they don't really seek help and yesterday ma'am was saying that uh, you know the duration of untreated psychosis for frank schizophrenia was as high as 10 years you know so so th there is going to be a delay in help seeking for these kind of things again you know adding to our uh, to, to the confusions and to the conundrum surrounding uh, something like prodrome and possibly there are you know very valid reasons for this because these symptoms are very mild most of the times they are likely to be egosyntonic the person may not really recognize that something's going wrong with me or i'm not doing something they may not realize it as something dysfunctional uh you know th they may seek help at general physicians or you know non mental health professionals and nobody may feel that there's a need to refer them to a psychiatrist because there is no psychiatric diagnosis there uh you know we don't really know whether such services exist at all in india i'm not aware of any service that is specifically looking at a uh, pre psychotic or pre schizophrenic uh, symptoms there will be a lot of misinterpretation uh, self medication fear of stigmatization and labeling and none of these reasons are actually um, implausible you know the, i mean any of us had vague symptoms like this we would all probably not you know think of getting mental health uh, evaluation at the first step um let me you know uh, take you to something that's probably closer to what you see happening in front of you right so i'm going to describe three patients who Uh, we've been treating um, at nimhans who literally in front of our eyes have you know turned um, to develop frank schizophrenia so there were two girls and a boy uh, we saw the girl uh, one of the girls at around 12 years of age the boy at 12 years and another girl much later at about 16 uh, the girl presented with exam anxiety that kept coming and going you know progressively worsening as she got older a uh, developed mood episode mixed affective state the boy presented with ocd you know many different kinds of obsessions and compulsions then started developing mood uh, related uh, changes uh, self harm referential ideas and uh, the, the third girl presented with different types of mood and anxiety symptoms the difficulty that with all of them that we faced is you know in child psychiatry if you do enough family work and you use some medicines most children will actually you know start doing well at least 5 uh, 6 months down the line right because the environment has a great role to play in how uh, you know the, the child does or recovers from their presenting symptom but there are instances where you get children like this where no matter what you do and you know i'm saying that they were here they've been with us from the age of 12 and now they are 17 so 5 years of follow up no matter what we did all three of them developed frank psychosis uh in follow up the first child at the age of 18 the second one at the age of 16 and the third one at the age of 17 right and 
you know frank positive symptoms delusions hallucinations what you will and and remember these were all people who had been on adequate treatment pharmacologically there were family interventions being done there were actually dedicated uh, residents or other staff who were following them up closely over time um we had also added antipsychotics as augmenting agents to treat uh, you know the different symptoms but none of that worked and they all developed um, schizophrenia also you know yesterday atara ma'am was saying that people who were married uh, had a lesser chance of relapse and they did well in the follow up so social stress and you know how the environment plays a role in what happens probably was also contributing to each of these children with attachment issues uh, family loading parental discord and uh, adverse childhood experiences like csa so th the reason why i'm putting this up is because you know we can try and think of something like prodrome but the truth is that even when there are frank uh, you know psychiatric symptoms there are diagnosable illnesses and you know you, you know you're doing everything you can to treat them but sometimes the onset of schizophrenia you know just cannot be prevented because you know probably the illness is um, greater than all our efforts that we are able to put in so is early intervention justified well schizophrenia is a rare disorder it's not uh, like developmental difficulties that are you know much more prevalent or anxiety in children or substance use it's not one of those uh, disorders however uh, the symptoms that point to the imminent onset are common right so, so i mean these two sentences don't really go along schizophrenia is rare but because i'm saying prodrome is basically you know a heterogeneous thing it can be anything all of us can have prodromal symptoms at some point or the other the source of referral determines conversion rates right so if a if i see and refer to pgi the conversion rates may be 50% whereas if you know somebody in the community or the school refers it may be very low under 10% right so the um, the, the the clinical expertise required to actually pick up you know early psychosis or pick up prodrome is uh, quite high there is a potential dangerousness of unnecessary interventions and there are probably some flaws in existing clinical practices i'll talk about the current treatment recommendations in a bit so how do we manage you know if at all uh, we do believe we're picking up people with these disturbances what do we do can we actually teach early interventions can we practice them are we truly going to be able to uh, you know um, uh, give any long term benefit Uh, you know so there are these multiple um, issues right that surround the entire concept of uh, prodrome um one of the, you know the important things in a country like india is also that you know is this something that's even going to bother the policy makers and planners in terms of prioritizing healthcare expenditure for something that's you know has such a low positive predictive value so um you know these are all the conundrums that exist however having said that there does seem to be some evidence for intervention right there are randomized control trials that say that you can postpone psychosis uh, in about 50 60% people in follow up has there been any experience in india um, i didn't come across any studies that have actually talked about treatment of prodromal symptoms from india but there are several studies uh, you know that have looked at uh, treating early treating psychosis early right so picking up psychosis very early on in the course and treating them intensively uh you know is something that has been done by several groups in india and we know that there are several moderators of outcome and all of these studies basically say pick it up early treat it well you will decrease disability in follow up right so so that we do know about psychosis so these are the canadian um, uh recommendations for treatment of uh, prodromal symptoms they um take from the nice guidelines as well as from the european guidelines so they've kind of put together what the current uh, practice recommendations are um what do you have to do you have to comprehensively assess you have to do a staged intervention model see what the current uh, presentation is and act accordingly um intervene for the presenting problem in whatever way is uh you know clinically uh, desirable interventions to prevent the development of persistence of functional deficits now i'm sure all of this sounds very familiar to anybody who's going to come seeking uh, you know mental health assistance you will do the same thing so you comprehensively assess treat what you can uh, stage the illness and say okay does this person only need 
uh, therapy do they only need supportive work or do they need cbt do they need family work so you know depending upon what the severity and what the presentation is you decide what has to be done ultimately over time to reduce disability what do you do if these prodromal or you know these vague presentations persist so what the treatment recommendations say are keep monitoring these people for at least 3 years why 3 years that's arbitrary we we don't know why 3 years it it could be longer depending upon who your patient is and the frequency and duration of monitoring is decided by the nature of the symptoms nature of the distress and the family functioning right um in general when we are working with at risk young people whether they are at risk for psychosis or they are at risk for you know any other mental health problem the most important thing is to engage these people in services and garner a lot of family support give them information about mental health uh, problems right so so many times um you know because uh, children will discuss something that they are that they have the vocabulary for you know sometimes even adolescents may not have the vocabulary to discuss uh, what they are feeling or you know what their thoughts are and what you know what is troubling them they may not always be very good at it so very often especially working with adolescents young adults the approach we have to take is we have to be proactive and give them information that you know this is what i've understood do you feel like this do you feel like that you know so so you give them the vocabulary you be proactive in helping them understand what may be going wrong with them to you know really make them feel supported um there are several challenges to any early intervention program in india um there is a low contact coverage for a systematic review that was published in uh, lancet psychiatry where it was found that only 40 to 50% of patients with schizophrenia actually contact mental health services not treatment effectiveness but just contact right so that's just about half for schizophrenia uh, you know talking about prodrome is um, probably many many uh, centuries away from now uh, there are constraints to the availability and affordability of care um, the rural urban differences lack of awareness a uh, stigma the multiple non medical belief models and more than anything else just the difficulties in identifying something like this right it it has to be a retrospective um lastly um, and i'm going to end with this there is you know what we call the prevention paradox um prodrome is a high risk strategy okay so what are we saying we we have tools we're going to use some scales to identify people at high risk for psychosis when you identify people at high risk for psychosis you may or may not be able to prevent them converting to psychosis but you may be doing that you may be investing so much time and effort in doing that without actually intercepting all preventable schizophrenia that exists right because there is a large chunk there is a substantial chunk of people 30 to 40% people with schizophrenia will not have a prodrome right so you may identify high risk and intervene there but you may still not prevent all schizophrenia whereas you know like we were saying the prodromal symptoms can be indicators of any mental illness in the future it's not necessary only schizophrenia so if you were to actually help the larger group of people with or without high risk symptoms then you know your prevention efforts may actually um have a larger preventive yield so universal and selective prevention strategies should actually be at the heart of our efforts uh you know rather than just a high risk strategy uh, so measures to reduce exposure to environmental factors better integration of migrant populations you know decreasing the social stress that people perceive and develop different kinds of mental health problems uh, reducing the stresses of urban life uh de addiction from drugs like cannabis a multiple gate screening a close follow up of course you know you do a close follow up of high risk but don't you know um ignore a people who have every other risk factors but just don't have high risk symptoms right now you know so so that can't be done because uh, mental health problems can affect those too so the take home messages there is increasing research on prodrome and prediction of psychosis in the last few decades uh, we have to use a combination of trait and state variables the state variables can exist in operationalized clusters the acute attenuated psychosis brief limited and genetic deterioration that i spoke about uh they have a moderate validity and predictive value not uh, substantially uh, high 
Interventions do show some benefit. Um, regular monitoring and informed clinical decision making are probably the current uh, best practice for individuals such as these. However, having said that, community mental health efforts are the larger preventive impact. Uh, what, uh, you know, again, so much of what ma'am has said yesterday and today, uh, you know, is just kind of ringing with us as we go along the CME. Uh, so what she was, she was talking about, that community psychiatry is not just about setting, an, you know, another center. It's not just I'll open a clinic in Banshankari also now that I have a clinic at Nimhans. It's not, that's not enough. But you have to actually, you know, it has to be a movement. Community mental health has to be a movement where, you know, everybody is given a lot of awareness and sensitization about how uh, mental morbidity and mental uh, health problems emerge. That's all. I'd like to end with that. Thank you all for your very patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Isha, for a kind of comprehensive and uh, kind of in-depth uh, presentation on the topic and uh, maybe